Everybody having a good lunch? Food okay so far? At least you got served, right? All right, good. Uh, I'm Stan Rosen, a member of the NSS board, and I'm here to uh, host you a little bit this afternoon. And I wanted to say a few words that you might not have heard already about the National Space Society, and then introduce uh, our guest speaker and some other notables who we have here today. First, let me say a few words about the National Space Society. There may be a few of you in here who don't know about the National Space Society. In fact, there may even be a few of you who are not members of the National Space Society. I hope you've gotten exposed enough to NSS through this conference to get an idea about why membership in the National Space Society is a good idea. This is an organization that's been around for a long time, since the early 70s, been very active nationally, internationally, works with people of all walks of life, not just science, scientists and technologists, politicians or engineers, and promotes the emergence of a spacefaring civilization. Not only space settlements, but the settlement, the moving of civilization into space in a revolutionary way that we're now seeing uh, humanity moving off the surface of the planet and including space in our civilization uh, that is the historical watershed of our lifetimes. Certainly when this period of history is remembered in the future, this is what this period of time will be remembered for, the emergence of our civilization into space and off the planet. The National Space Society is a key part of that. We want you to join our movement and be part of that activity as we move forward together. What are we doing to make that happen? Well, you've seen the International Space Development Conference now, and you know that these are annual events that serve not only for networking and education, but for inspiration. And I hope you take some of this inspiration back with you to the people that you know when you go home. One way you can do that is by ordering a T-shirt. A T-shirt for your kids, a T-shirt for your wife, Hey, a t our husband, or a t-shirt for you. From the National Space Society, the black of space, in this case, with a commemorative logo on the back commemorating this event. You can order these t-shirts from the NSS desk in the registration lobby. This is a tremendous keepsake, and I know those of you who have purchased the t-shirts from past events are glad you did. In fact, I've even seen some among the attendees here today. Don't forget to be able to get that. We also have a number of other activities that NSS is involved in that you need to know about. One is our policy activities. We have a newly invigorated group of policy leaders <clears throat> selected from some of the leading space advocates, the leading space enthusiasts, and the leading space leaders, if you'll pardon the expression, from around the country and around the world, who are looking at very important ways that NSS is engaged and can be engaged in the policy process in Washington, D.C., and in capitals around the world. One of our latest products is a position paper, which you may have read, on the development of space, ways to opportunities to improve life on Earth by using space, which is a theme that we've carried through in this conference, as well as in our policy initiatives when we go to the Hill in Washington. And you heard last night, for example, from Dr. Kalam, about our interest in space solar power, a very good example of an emerging way to use space technology to change and, in fact, to continue to revolutionize life on Earth. NSS is dedicated to making that happen in a very productive and positive way. We want you to join us. You've also seen uh, evidence of NSS's involvement with the next generation. I belong to so many organizations who lament the fact that they don't talk to the next generation. They're talking to themselves. We are engaged through educational activities, through outreach activities, through chapter activities, through uh, the kind of competitions that are run around the world, thanks to the people in this room who are leading it, through NSS, to engage the next generation, the people you heard last night, who demonstrated their commitment and their excitement about what we stand for and about their future and how it involves space or something that should excite us all. We welcome their participation. We want you to go see their posters. 
the results of the contest where they are advertising our next conference next year in Los Angeles on the theme of space settlement. Go back and see their posters, talk to the students, encourage them, talk to them as peers, get them engaged. They're gonna be with us for a long time after we're gone. That's what NSS is all about. I also wanna mention our chapter activities. We have a number of chapters, and I, did, I didn't count uh, before I walked in here, but it was on the order of 50 chapters now, around the country and around the world, that are engaged in taking this networking down to the local level. You know, we can all get on the internet now and read everything we wanna know about space. We can look up the facts. We can get the news. But where do we get a chance to talk to others who are equally enthusiastic, to get the backstory, to fill in, to decide what it means, to think about the implications? What are we gonna do about it? How, what's next? That's what the chapter engagement is about. At the local level, where we do our face-to-face -face contact. The same way that you have an ability to network here, our 50 plus chapters have an ability to network around the world. Join your chapter. We have folks here from a number of chapters. There's gonna be, I think it was announced this morning, a chapter council meeting of our chapter leaders. The chapters are an important part of the National Space Society. And I also wanted to mention to you that we have a number of exciting individual projects that are in the works. Some of you have already heard of some of them. We just finished a Kickstarter campaign, most of you know what Kickstarter is, and raised a significant amount of money to build an educational and motivational and inspirational video that can be available on YouTube, it'll be distributed through hard copy, it'll be distributed soft copy, that's going to really knock your socks off. I know there's a lot of videos out there, wait till you see this one that's coming along. It's being produced by virtue of our Kickstarter campaign to tell the story that we're trying to get told. You're also going to see some other campaigns, some of which I can't, we're not ready to announce yet, where we may be able to even do some things that have never been done before. I'll give you some teasers. Maybe put some things in space that have never gone into space before. Bring some things back from space that have never been on display before. You'll see some of the ideas. To stimulate interest and enthusiasm and encouragement, of the new opportunities to go into space and encourage space settlement. So that's why I wanted to take the opportunity before you today to encourage your participation in, in National Space Society. One way you can do this while you're here is to help us make this a better organization by giving us your feedback. And Monday morning, I think it starts at nine o'clock, Joe Rauscher's in the room, am I right, Joe? Nine o'clock? 10 o'clock, thank you, 10 o'clock Monday morning, we're gonna have a session that Joe is leading to get your feedback, a structured way to get your feedback about what NSS is doing and how NSS ought to manage its affairs going forward. We need your brain power and your involvement and your participation to help us be good. There's Joe with his thumb in the air. But you'll, be, you'll see him 10 o'clock Monday morning. If you can help him do that job, that'd be great. We'll be participating in that. I could go on. I won't. You can tell I'm enthusiastic about NSS. I hope you are too. My real purpose here today is to do the simplest job in the world. It's an, it, to introduce a person who literally needs no introduction to an audience that's heard enough introductions. So all I have to do is get out of the way and make room for Buzz Aldrin. Well, 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 you're going to climb down. Maybe we have stairs. We have stairs. While, while Buzz is here, I want to mention, as you might expect, Buzz's book is, is, is for sale, and you will be able to buy the book immediately after we leave here as you exit this hall and in the, in the registration hall. And once you've bought the book, this is an opportunity of a lifetime, and I'm serious about that, to get a Buzz Aldrin autograph. They don't come easy. Buzz will be at the back of the exhibit hall signing autographs. <laughs> this is not a joke. I love, I'm going to get one uh, for Buzz. Buzz's new book is great, by the way. I have read it. It talks about a lot of things that, uh, fortunately, he and I have talked about over the years and uh, brings it together in a way that uh, was very unique and interesting to me, and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Buzz, very nice to have you. A man, a legend in his own time, ladies and gentlemen, Buzz Aldrin.
That sounds like a professorial introduction. <laughs> he used to be a good engineer from the Air Force, and now he's a professor. <clears throat> uh, I, I don't want you to confuse two terms, two projects. Unified Space Vision is kind of a replacement for vision for space exploration. But we're going to unify five things. Exploration, science, development, commercial, and security. <clears throat> and Stan knows if I put security first, we would be warmongers. We're not. We're defense. Uh, Peace through strength, I think, is, uh, is our motto. And the other one from Apollo is, we came in peace for all mankind. I couldn't have done a mission to Mars without uh, Leonard David who lives up in the mountains with the greatest collection of space memorabilia you could ever imagine. Fortunately, my uh, youngest son lives up in Denver too, so we would get together and, uh, and kind of beat things around and come up with these eight chapters and just a beautiful foreword uh, written by Andy Aldrin. It uh, brought tears to his sister to, to read uh, what he thought about his uh, father's activities. I am not a uh, Rick Tumlinson, so I'm not going to be wandering around. I, I, I guess I could show you my socks. <laughs> they, they will not be worn tonight at a, at a more formal dinner function. I usually use a, a teleprompter. That's why I have things all written out. And the reason I have things all written out is uh, hopefully so I don't ramble on and uh, get lost and then try and find myself uh, or have uh, Christina have a hard time finding out where the hell I am. Um, so I do have that uh, pretty well written down. So if uh, and I'm not quite that good in doing the teleprompter back and you, you really think I'm speaking to everybody, but uh, I've, I've gotten pretty good with the teleprompter. Not so good with turning pages. Occasionally they'll, they'll skip a few. But I do want to thank uh, ISDC of NSS. And at one time I was chairman of your wonderful organization. You've now got a uh, a very capable, very e expansive, uh, uh, down under Kirby Eichen. Uh I've had great admiration for how he comes up here and, and pulls it all together. ISDC stands for International Space Development. We have to develop with what we've got and we come together once a year uh, in, in a great attempt to, to do that. <clears throat> I feel very strongly that we need to get the world excited again about space exploration and have the pioneering spirit to reach beyond our boundaries and current capabilities. I want the next generation to feel as we did back when I was privileged to be a part of the Apollo program. This is important not only for the USA, but for the rest of the world. Um, I mentioned, I mentioned uni unified space vision. Now what I don't want you to confuse that with is United Strategic Space Enterprise. That's probably a far more important development, but uh, uh, Stan mentioned space policy, and that is what USS Enterprise is all about, to boldly go where no one's gone before 
which is going to examine space policy from the very beginning. Some of the great things that we did in space policy and some of the not so great things that sort of led us to where we are today. Uh, I just heard uh, Bob Zubrin uh, uh, talk about uh, how he felt we were uh, not in such a great position and it uh, is really kind of based on the policy that comes out of the executive branch, uh, the leadership and the lack of the lack of congressional support in I'm running that sentence backwards. We, we, what we don't need is congressional policies that run contrary to the executive policy and result in short-term objectives for political gain to the various people, sometimes on the appropriations uh, committees. So I, I think you will see that USS Enterprise, uh, as we really put it together with 10 or 12 uh, experts from various fields, retired without a lot of conflict of interest or, or bias, is able to point out, it's easy to point out the good things, but it's not so easy to point out where we have run amok. Were I to do that, uh, I probably wouldn't be around. My legs would be cut off by politicians. Uh, uh, so, but, but to have a group of real experts examine what has sort of gone wrong so we don't let that happen again. And we have a unified space vision. Mankind has dreamed for centuries of reaching space, the moon, and even the stars. But it wasn't until the 20th century that man took his first powered flight. In 1903, on a windy morning in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, the Wright Brothers Flyer took their first flight defying gravity with the help of an atmosphere. My mother, Marion Moon, was born that same year. Only 66 years later, Neil and I stepped on the moon, fulfilling the dreams of millions. But I'm here to tell you about... <laughs> and thank God for those dreams. But I'm here to tell you about my plans for the future in space. What's next? It's been 44 years since we stepped on the lunar surface with too little progress to show for it. I've always felt Mars should be the next gener des destination <laughs> following our landings on the moon. I've been very vocal for a, about this for a long time, but the dream of reaching Mars looks like it's finally getting closer to becoming a reality with the Curiosity rover now on the surface of Mars and showing us more than ever before. I'm hoping it will pique the curiosity of young people of the world into the idea of exploring beyond Earth and the moon and on to Mars. Obviously, I am very passionate about our future in space. And people ask me, not these people, but <laughs> elsewhere, why do we need to go to Mars or why do we even need a space program? Because I think we, as a people, as a nation, feel good about ourselves and the future of our country. By venturing outward into space, we improve life for everyone here on Earth. The scientific advancements and innovations that come from this type of research create products and technology that we use in our daily lives and provide 
even more convenience to people all over the world. Cell phones, I've got two of them, but I left them there so it won't interrupt me. Um, television, GPS, all of these wouldn't have been possible without the investments in the space program. Not all of them came from NASA. A good number of them came from preparing to defend our country with the miniaturization needed by securing the nation in a mutual assured destruction. Fortunately, we were able to modify that with strategic defense initiative. And despite the cries of Star Wars, this I am firmly, I firmly believe began the re-evaluation within the Soviet Union by Gorbachev and others and resulted in a uh, more peaceful situation uh, as the Cold War sort of wound to the wound down. So how do we get people excited about space again? And the big question, how do we get there? We need a plan. We also need a leader in the world to state a public goal with a specific timeline. I've got ideas about how that should happen around the six 50th anniversaries of all our moon landings. But I've also laid out a plan in my new book Mission to Mars, My Vision for Space Exploration, which came out in early May of this year, published by National Geographic Society. I wanted it to be called Missions. All I had to do was put an S on it. Because we're not talking about just one trip there. We're talking about multiple missions to eventually settle and colonize Mars. <laughs> Years ago, I devised a method with cycling orbits of spacecraft on continuous trajectories between Earth and Mars. Let me show you what I mean. Oh, no, it's the wrong one. Hold on. That's the wrong one? Yeah, Page eight, page nine. Uh, Rob sent me the wrong one. So oh. It doesn't have the wrong one. Doesn't have? Don't have All right, you, that's probably just as good. <laughs> we, we're in the process uh, of revising because what I need to show you is the history of Earth-Moon cycling orbits. Good system, really good, especially for space adventurers. If you would like to build a system that continually exposes space adventures, adventurers or tourism to a flyby of the rear side or the front side of the moon without getting off. Uh, that's relatively easy to do. The Russians are trying to sell it for 100 million a seat. But I'm sure if you don't have to reuse a spacecraft every time, you just intercept it as it swings by the Earth, and then it comes back again. You can do several of these in a one-month cycle. Obviously, that wasn't considered as a good way to go from the surface of the Earth to the surface of Mars. John Hubolt devised a much, much better system than Werner von Braun. As much as Dr. Von Braun did with the Saturn V, his, he didn't call it this, but I will, his multi-purpose crew vehicle required two Saturn Vs instead of one Saturn V. A lot of people think it was Earth orbit rendezvous. Earth orbit must be simpler than lunar orbit rendezvous. But the fact of the matter is, with lunar orbit rendezvous, we took one Saturn V, and Earth orbit rendezvous required two. In the uh, early 80s, I began to apply my orbital rendezvous 
seat of the pants expertise to lunar spacecraft systems that would perform these perpetually cycling orbits between Earth and Mars. Central to the idea was using the relative gravity forces of the Earth and the gravity forces of the Moon to sustain the orbit, thereby expending much less fuel. You just intercept it, and then you look as you swing by the Moon. And this is called gravity assist. But there was a catch. The approach took longer, or took more investment of uh, finances uh, in order to swing by the uh, moon. Good for the tourists, not so good for the person that wants to land. You might as well use what we pioneered so successfully um, in the 60s and 70s, lunar orbit rendezvous. Then my good friend, Tom Payne, former NASA administrator during the number, a number of Apollo program expeditions, including mine, he urged me to develop cycling orbit concept to the much more intricate task and the goal of supporting and sustaining human missions to Mars. And lo and behold, it works. We're going to add a slide that is during one 26-month period, you swing by the Earth. Five months later, you swing by Mars. You keep going out because you came by Mars pretty fast. And you come back later at the total of 26 months and repeat it. Keep doing that. There are some relatively pioneering aspects of that idea, instead of the grand tour of using gravity assist to swing by planets and look at moons and so forth. To, I, to my knowledge, I was the first one that said, let's swing by something and come back to where we started from and, and see if we can make something useful out of doing that. And so now the, uh, the cycling concept has uh, been improved significantly by a former JPL uh, engineer, manager, uh, who witnessed my early attempts at cycling orbits to Mars in 1985. And it was also in Tom Paine's wonderful commission report, Pioneering the Space Frontier, sort of interrupted by the uh, Challenger accident the report uh, was due to come out in 86, and it eventually did. Now, this chart that, that we almost had, had the two synodic period, uh, but it's pretty complicated. We'll get back to one in live motion in, in a little bit. Well, it'll be the next one. Okay. Uh, so you will see. Uh, Yeah, can you go backwards too? Back, come back to this one. Yeah. Okay. No, no, not that one. No, this this is the one that's going to show it in motion, and uh, uh, it it it's really quite fantastic. Uh, yeah. No, no, we're not going out there. <laughs> Hold, hold my horse powers. <laughs> Ob obviously, the Earth's orbit is in blue. Mars' orbit is in red. And uh, the transfer is in green. And then it shows a number of orbits, about an orbit and a half that goes out around Mars, swings by the Earth now. Nobody gets on or off. They certainly would have exceeded the radiation hazard if they'd been on to get off and they got on. Because it's not going to come back to the Earth again for uh, a year and a half. But what it does in this two synodic period, uh, 
swing by opportunities. It allows a resupply, a uh, fixing of things on the cycler that may have uh, uh, not performed uh, properly. But then it makes another green swing by every 52 months. Now, that's not every 26 months, so we need a second cycler. And, uh, I don't have that one, but okay, that's, that's good. Okay, so now, this is a, a, a very clear to see what's going on. This is the radial distance from the sun, which is down there somewhere, between Earth orbit in a circular coplanar. Uh, this is one astronomical unit. Mars, the red line, is 1.52. In reality, it would be elliptic. Uh, so we make calculations in circular coplanar to get a pretty good idea of what uh, what's going to happen. And then somebody comes up and, and does the final result. And uh, usually, it uh, results in variations of uh, transfer time. Uh, matter of fact, it goes from about 112 days transfer to 220 something. So it depends on the time uh, of the Mars cycle. It repeats itself every 15 years. Now, I believe that we can do this. If you notice, we depart Earth on a green trajectory. We go out again. Then we come by E3. That's where we do a uh, swing by of the Earth that takes energy out of the orbit. And then from E3, you see a year and a half before we get to E4. And wow, we go back to Mars at uh, M5. Now, the dotted line shows the, uh, the other cycler spacecraft that does the same thing uh, between E1 prime and, and so forth, and it would complete. So we've got a cycler that does it for 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and another one, 2, 4, 6, 8. And we can implement these as we see it fits into some of the uh, construction missions that are being done by Phobos as we do tests of this system. And then we implement the system with the hyperbolic rendezvous of the cycler with essentially just a Mars lander. Everything else is on the cycler. When we get to Mars, the Mars lander makes a direct descent and uh, landing. All of the support systems, radiation protection, uh, crew sustainability, uh, communications, everything else is on board the cycler. And I believe that we can do this sometime in the time period 2035 to 2040. Some people say, well, why does it take so long? Well, why is it taking so long to get from the last lunar landing, December 72, uh, until where we are today? It's going to take a while, and we have to do progressive improvements on a unified space vision. OK, now we're going to go to. Uh, Uh, oh, we're going to skip the yeah, yeah. what the cycler looks like? Okay. All right, we're going to come back to what the cycler looks like. For a long time, I, I knew what you do with something to get it to do what you want it to do. But when somebody says, uh, hey, draw me a picture of what the hell a cycler looks like, I wasn't sure until I began to look at what does an interplanetary space vehicle look like to take people somewhere? Do you want me to show that? No, no. Let's. Now, this one in motion, you may not be able to see that in the back, but again, the, the red circle is uh, Mars, and the blue circle is uh, Earth, and if you see the little green dot, when we get this sucker going, you see Earth is in about the right position to initiate a transfer, and the dotted lines are going to show that up and back up again, Mars distance, then the swing by the Earth, 
and a lowering of energy, and then a year and a half later, we make another transfer. Now, the, the other cycler would be making a transfer geometrically between this one and the next one. So uh, let's put it in motion. Oops, sorry. Oops. Sorry. All right, that's what the cycler looks like, sort of. All right, there we go, Blake. There's a transfer. Now the crew disembarks. And uh, there it goes out, Mars distance. Inside Earth, out Mars distance again. Now down here, it's going to stop. No, it has an Earth encounter, but nobody's on board. Now it goes a year and a half, and now it's ready for another transfer. And you'll see that take place right there. And on and on and on. We make the investment in this kind of once. And we have to evolve to what we're investing in. And you'll see the graduate student uh, doctoral candidate at uh, Purdue uh, has done a good bit of this. Uh, we have uh, the view that we're going to see next of uh, maybe what an inter... No. Yeah, all right. Here is an interplanetary space vehicle. The cryopropulsion is there and can be discarded. Uh, I show a crew vehicle, uh, a modified maybe Orion vehicle, and the deep space hab, I will call it a hab from time to time. I will also call it an exploration module because it's going to do a lot of things. At the end is a node. Now, the floor of this four-floor exploration module, as designed uh, by an engineer, Michelle Rucker at JSC, uh, along with uh, Lockheed people, for the president's 20, 20, 2025 human mission to uh, an asteroid and back. Now. Uh, while I've got that up there, you see, for to carry out something interplanetary, we have two different sizes of crew vehicles. Now let's just go through the hypothetical derivation. Suppose we know what we need for interplanetary space, life support, and all the rest of the things, and we put it in one large sphere. All right, let's compare that one large sphere with two medium. I think most in this room would agree that two medium for implementation, for redundancy, for avoiding some single point failures, for production, would be a desirable way to go. Doesn't lead as big a launch vehicle. All right, so we got two medium. Now let's do something with them that engineers do. Let's do a trade study where one gets smaller and the other one gets bigger. Pretty soon the smaller one disappears, goes to zero, and we're right back where we started from. Now somewhere in that trade space is an ideal combination. It's also good to make use of what you may be working on if it satisfies what you want. Now when I say if, I mean reusable, not by airbag landing and then relaunch. I mean reusable in orbit. We would like to be able to air break and uh, use at, at a return planetary atmosphere of both vehicles. Now, the small vehicle is what we used to call a space taxi. At one planet or another, it would go from one orbit to another because it takes the crew and a small amount of fuel to move it from one. The larger vehicle is going to be uh, an exploration module, a HAB module, a space station. So we're going to put it somewhere and have a tendency to leave it there. If we can reuse it and bring it back, yeah, we can do that too. It gives us a little more flexibility. So obviously, this uh, exploration module is where we would control things from space to elsewhere, like from L2 
to a robot, science robot, on the surface of Mars. From L2 to commercial caterpillar mining activities in the dark craters where we get the crystals of ice, process those into canisters of uh, water, then freeze it to ice, then the Japanese, our partners, along with India, uh, form a global corporation, and the Japanese launch uh, these to L1, where we can control robots on the front side of the moon from one of those uh, exploration modules. And it can also be the, the crux, the center point of a refueling activity at L1. Now, I think that about a third or a fourth generation of that HAB module with the node can be landed with some device in between the cryo and the HAB. We can land it, dig a hole, and bury it as much as possible, cover it over on the moon as the central location of a international Mars base. If somebody wants to come up with a better design of an international Mars base or international moon base, I'd like to talk to them about it. But I would put this in the center and then have Bigelow or somebody else land four inflatables around from the node we can traverse from one place to another and we can traverse outward to the Chinese activities on the moon, the Japanese activities on the moon, the Indian activities on the moon, and the European space activities. Now, if Russia really means they're going to build a permanent base instead of just a bluff, so we would invest all sorts of things in sending our NASA astronauts there again. We already beat them once. Why would they want to uh, show just how much we beat them the first time? Well, when, <laughs> and, and uh, they, they would love to partner with the Chinese as long as they pay for it, uh, which they don't appear to do, <laughs> or with the European Space Agency, uh, uh, as, as a quick aside, I'm really interested in promoting English-speaking nations. Why? Because I think those are the nations that preserved the world from tyranny in World War I, certainly World War II, the Cold War, and if any nation or group of nations present, prevent the world from uh, radicalism going outward, it's going to be the uh, English-speaking nations. And I think the most important one is India. And, and I've discussed this on a telephone conversation uh, with your uh, speaker from last night, and uh, we'll do that uh, also. And I'm promoting a... Uh, uh, a three-nation consortia of Japan and their desire to produce landers and ascent vehicles for the moon, and the U.S. that won't produce landers and ascent vehicles for a few of the things we want to do, and India that needs someone help in what we did 40 years ago with landers, and what the Chinese are developing and, and will be of assistance. Now, is that a bad coalition? Well, look at Russia and China. What do they have in common? They don't, their language doesn't look the same, and it doesn't sound the same, but they get together primarily to confront the West and to confront the United States in our activities of coming in peace for all mankind. So I see nothing wrong with the English-speaking nations of the world. If people thought at one time that uh, German was the technical language of the world, it no longer is. English is. The French may still think that French is the diplomatic language, but it ain't. It's English. And, and I think we need to be proud of the record that we've established and bring helped 
help to those nations that uh, we're not helping already. The UK, of course, has to get back into space again after a previous prime minister decided it wasn't worth the gamble, but she's not around anymore. So uh, <laughs> we can help uh, the UK, and they can come along with us so that it's not just the US trying to control everything out there. It's uh, Canada, it's Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and India. And, and I think the potential of it coming up with what we used to call a balance of power. Uh, I think we still uh, need to encourage that and come to grips with international cooperation above the atmosphere as best we can. Should have started with the International Space Station, but it didn't. And uh, some things are, are never too late. Uh, we can certainly begin to uh, provide a, uh, an atmosphere of cooperation on mutual efforts. Maybe it's space-based solar power. We need a lot of launch vehicles to do that. And somebody needs a lot of launch vehicles to put the international components at the moon that we are going to bring together. It's a very complex task. And somebody, including us, has to put the components at the International Mars Base. And then we put those together also. That is a difficult task. But how are we going to learn to do that? There's a wonderful, tropical, big island called the Big Island of Hawaii. And that's where we're going to practice doing these things. We're going to put the first element down there where we would like it to land. And we're going to put the second element and then through a satellite to Houston Control or Ames. Somewhere we're going to do that and we're going to bring these things together, make a connection, uneven terrain, and, and come up with ways of hooking up the electrical systems, the uh, uh, atmospheric systems, and the water systems, fluid systems. Difficult task. That's for the United States to do. And it shouldn't cost billions and billions to do that. But that building of a base on the moon and on Mars is critical to supremacy of the United States in space transportation and in expanding human presence outward in the solar system. That's the key that should govern what our purposes are, remaining number one in transportation. Uh, so the cycler, now if that's good for an interplanetary vehicle, bingo. Put two of them together, side by side. Can we go backwards now? now this drawing was built by a uh, group that's going to do a Buzz Aldrin's space program, manager. space program manager. It's a game, a computer game. The, that was the sun, the Mars went by. And uh, now these circles, they're not necessarily, at least I don't think they will be photovoltaic. I think they are representative of uh, solar dynamic. You people are familiar with planetary resources and deep space industries. Look up planetary power and its evolution of solar dynamic. Those were the two big circular things we were going to put at the end of the space station, but money or something prevented that from uh, happening. Uh, but I think uh, I personally think that the efficiencies, the cost, the size of solar dynamic uh, will make a big impression on uh, photovoltaic. I, I could be wrong. Uh, so now here is the cycler. We've got connections between the two in different places. But again, it uh, has the components of a uh, space taxi. And, and it has the components at this end now of the uh, solar electric propulsion system needed to make small trim co corrections in the uh, cycler orbit. And that, of course, can be combined with what Purdue has looked at in how do we put things in cycling orbits. 
At least somebody is looking at that. And what do we need to be able to do it? Uh, you could always come up with what's the mass we need to get to Mars and then split it into different things or, or run it backwards. We have to design what are the ideal kind of vehicles we'd like to have and then what are the ways of assembling these and refueling them at different places and departing from a high elliptic orbit where you apply the velocity at the perihelion, you get the most out of the uh, addition of delta B by doing it there. And, and for each mission, it's a little bit different, but that's probably the marshalling orbit. Now, the moon goes around and fuel from the moon can get off into that uh, cycling orbit, that marshalling orbit for departure to interplanetary dis distances. I'm uh, a good bit out of uh, pages. Now, uh, we're going to go into uh, a few words, word charts that you can read. They may have some connection to what I'm saying. <laughs> But, but they were parts of what was submitted to the Augustine Commission in 2009. Obviously, Mars is the ultimate destination. We can get there, but we need global cooperation to make this happen. Global at the moon to allow us to pioneer, and then global landings of objects at Mars to be put together and transport people there. The U.S. needs to continue to be the space transportation leader. And I think we should capitalize on the dynamism of the commercial market to develop a runway landing system. Something innovative instead of steroids with capsules that land in the ocean. Just because Elon loves salt water doesn't mean that that's the way our future vehicles should come back from space. And somebody likes airbags, uh, and they find out that those are too expensive, so they're going to be back into landing in the ocean again. That's not the way to do it. We will, uh, the, these commercial transportations from the surface of the Earth, of crew and uh, other delivery of car cargo, not together in the same vehicle as we were forced to do with the space shuttle because of marketing and of having jobs in as many states as we could so that we could pass the uh, legislation to keep the ISS alive. I, I worry about our being caught in an unproductive <coughs> race to the moon. And if you realize that the Orion is originally conceived in the vision for space exploration, couldn't put itself and a lander into lunar orbit. Now, if you've looked at pictures of uh, the Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle, all it is is two vehicles, a propulsion system tacked onto the end of the Orion. Now, if I were building the propulsion system, I'd love it because we got so much invested in Orion, that's for sure going to continue on or we're going to really go. So what, how would you like to be the builder of the propulsion system on a guaranteed success vehicle that doesn't air brake for reusability on orbit? That's what a Block II Orion should really be. Uh, Third and, and most important, we should establish and direct our focus on a permanent human presence before 2040. Two decades of permanence moving toward it from 2020, the midpoint of 50th anniversaries of uh, uh, Apollo. <laughs> By my calculation, it's also the re-election year of whoever succeeds President uh, Obama in 2016. So if you want to have an influence, you better pay attention to uh, uh, who gives the executive policy orders in 
2016 and beyond. And uh, maybe if you want your name to go down with that person's name because that one gets it and, and makes a commitment within two decades around the uh, 2019 in July, 50th anniversary of, uh, of our mission. Now, if, uh, if you make the first step by the groundworks uh, leading up to that, including the leadership at the moon, the commercial doing things that it should do, that is bringing rocks back from out there, back to look at back here, that shouldn't be a government job. The government may help to introduce the low thrust engines, but low thrust engines just take a long time to bring something back to get there and bring it back. It's not the government job to be doing that. It's commercial people, deep space industries or uh, planetary resources. And I believe that by accomplishing these three goals, we will do more to advance the U.S. national interest than any other po space policy initiative we could envision. So now we're ready to send humans beyond the moon. We have or can affordably develop the technology to send humans on various missions toward Mars and especially Martian moons. Now, if I could plant a seed into uh, a chap by the name of John Holdren, the science advisor to the president, uh, what we need to do is to make a statement about U.S. leadership at the moon of an international lunar development authority. Declan O'Donnell is moving a little bit in that direction that we bring nations together and we make some statements about where the base is going to be, what it's going to look like, and how other nations are going to help us build that base by landing the different objects and we'll put them together. But we don't need NASA astronauts to do that. We need them elsewhere. We need them to define at the space station the test bed for long-term life support then a prototype of the exploration module at the space station. Lo and behold, that serves pretty well as a safe haven. Something goes wrong with the space station, everybody gets into that vehicle. It's long duration, life support, a little crowded. But the commercial people delivering people to the space station would just love it if they didn't have to leave their spacecraft up there for six months or a year or whatever it takes. The Russians love it because we pay for it. Right now we're paying for the transportation too. So uh, how do we kind of bring this about? The recent, recent Inspiration Mars uh, mission, flyby, uh, proposed by Dennis Tito, I thought for a long time he was just satisfied with being the first tourist and kind of hiding away down there on Ocean Avenue with uh, Wiltshire One making more money. But now I uh, understand why he uses his JPL background and wants to develop something that really can be done and not wait till 2031, which is the next time this favorable uh, total transit time uh, reaches kind of a minimum. We can't quite do it by 2016, but 2018 looks good. 500 days, a little over a year and a half. And, and I had to remind him that uh, when they get back, uh, they're about ready to uh, begin to help us celebrate the 50th anniversary of landing on the moon. He said, oh, is that right? Yeah. I said, that's the way I figure it. And, uh, and, and now I'm, I know that his mission is going to have to have a backup spacecraft and a backup crew. Uh, I think I've settled in on some things that we can do with that trained crew for a long duration mission. Maybe they can do an easier, just a one year 
flyby of a comet, or even less, a visit to an asteroid. But what is the purpose of sending a spacecraft to visit an asteroid? Maybe you can take a few pictures of the asteroid, a asteroid, but the purpose is proving out the spacecraft at greater distances than the moon. That's what I thought he was talking about when he said his human visit to an asteroid in 2025. Very good idea, no matter who is the president to chart that one. I think we could upgrade that as the next one as it leads toward human mission to my preference is Phobos. So that can be uh, a destination during this president's term and the organizing of the international moon activities. That's enough to earn a uh, two position presidential commitment, a permanence at Mars within two decades and just think of the history of the human species 100,000, 10,000 years from now as we look back on big things that leaders have done and to commit to the movement of the human species from one planet to another, in, in my calculation, that's a damn big deal. And that's going to be remembered. And it's up to you guys and me to convince <laughs> leaders to make that kind of a commitment. We have to spell it out exactly what the plan is, how we're going to do it. So we go back to the recommendations of almost 20 years ago, which recommended research on the ISS for exploration, technology, and operations. Now we have an operational ISS and we can use it to test bed the long-term life support stuff. Government needs that. So does Dennis. Let's have the government do that in a timely fashion to be able to add to uh, his ground testing with the same company that uh, does life support for Orion, and that's Paragon. They're the partners uh, with uh, Inspiration Mars. And then I would propose, of course, we occupy L2, then L1, and build on the robotic control of science robots. We sure have demonstrated how to do that at Mars with long-term life support. You getting ready to kick me off? No, I'm OK. Oh, well, I got, I I got water here. You are? Who? Christina says I got to speed up. Now, so we need to learn how to construct the exploration module at the space station. And then we do unmanned or manned or commercial visits flying by a comet. Just think of what the Earth guys with their binoculars looking at the tail of the comet and the spacecraft swings by. And through uh, prudent calculation, we're going to crash the upper stage into the comet while these guys are going by. And these people are going to see, boop. Uh, worldwide, they will see what America has done in developing spacecraft for interplanetary travel. Uh, that's the purpose of doing things between mo the moon and Mars, develop the spacecraft. Uh, let's show the next one, I believe. This is what I submitted in 2009 to the Augustine Commission. Now you notice I was one lone voice who cured the gap, who cured the money we're paying to the Russians. Sure, it's expensive, but continuing to fly the shuttle once a year, I believe could have been weighed against what we're uh, kind of losing. All right. so. They're now in museums. We can't redo that decision. But at least it was an imaginative one of curing the problems that we're now facing for quite a while. Some of these test bed support at the ISS and the uh, uh, first exploration safe haven. Then we uh, deliver to L1 and L2 and L1. 
And if you're going to deliver something from low Earth orbit to L2, why not do cycling orbits between Earth and the moon to demonstrate what the commercial people can do as we test the propulsion and the guidance system? That's what the government, I think, should do, could do. Why not? They probably won't, but that's what they could do. Then we end up with an L1 refueling place. We have a LEO refueling base. We can actually uh, fly by that comet, maybe unmanned, maybe a CubeSat, and we can visit on our exploration interplanetary vehicle. We can visit some of these uh, asteroids. Probably we'll have to slide the visits to uh, uh, Phobos five, ten years uh, off into the future, just the way we slide off the uh, cycling orbit delivery. Now, the last mission, if we, if we take three missions at Phobos, each one of them a year and a half with three people assembling what has been landed there by us and a lot of international uh, components of the Mars base, I was pretty generous giving three year and a half periods to do this. Whatever is the last one should have a lander. We got three guys there that know more about what they've been putting together than anybody here on Earth. So they got a lander, let's land them a couple days, a week, before the six coming from the Earth. The added benefit of that numerically is uh, we add three to six, and that makes an odd number of people for uh, voting purposes. We got nine there in the first delivery. Um, to reach beyond low Earth orbit requires a progressive suite of missions that are vital underpinnings of foundation for a unified space vision. Putting in place and staying uh, as a uh, uh, on track with a unified approach to space must begin now or soon. I need to update this chart because I created it in 09, and uh, we didn't implement some of those, and we didn't envision cycling orbits. Can you imagine somebody coming up with a transportation system that Tom Paine put in his 18, I mean, 1985, pioneering the space frontier, cycling orbits, go, go back and look at that report. What has NASA done with cycling orbits since then? Zero. Maybe they're the only ones that think they can be innovative. Some companies certainly adhered and not invented here. Uh, we, all, we all know that tendency is innovative ideas get stymied. And I suggest that going to Mars means permanence. Just look at the expenses of bringing somebody back. It's monumental. What is our purpose? To build up people to a sustainability, to add to the number of people there. Can you imagine the historical significance of those three plus six people going down in history with the communications we've got right now. No wonder uh, 80,000 people have applied for Mars One under the assumption that it might work. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there are times when, when national and international efforts need to be harnessed together to come up with a uh, system. We can be We'll welcome the assistance of uh, getting our explorers into low Earth orbit via commercial and maybe some other systems. Uh, my, my construction of the lunar base <clears throat> allows Golden Spike a place to go. It'll, it allows uh, Bigelow, somebody to use his inflatables. We're going to have to make a, a, a crucial decision at some point. Can we afford a rigid exploration module, HAB, of considerable size? I'm sure it would be uh, 
of greater diameter than the, uh, the, the HAB modules that were delivered to the space station by the uh, space shuttle. Can we afford to have Boeing, Lockheed, SpaceX, Alania, build those and pay for them? Or is it going to be cheaper to move in a government, revised government improved inflatable structure? That's a big decision we have to make, but it's a, a big one in cost. So let's find out what the comparison between those opportunities is going to come up with. The International Space Station is the ideal place for long duration life support and a safe haven and to launch or to at least do the testing maybe of some of the interplanetary and uh, taxi modules. By implementing this step-by-step -step vision, just as we did with the single-seat Mercury, the two-seat Gemini, the ideal fighter pilot spacecraft, and the three-man complex Apollo program will plunge further and further outward. We need to make space relevant again. And I can think of no single action the current administration could take which would demonstrate to the world that the United States will be the beacon for the development of humanity and lay the groundwork of development for a follow-on president's national commitment to Mars' permanent mission. With each step of this plan, whether it be the utilization of the ISS, our first visits to a truly extraterrestrial body, the vision will captivate the imagination of the entire globe. We have researched or developed most of the technology to support a Martian settlement. There's really not that much new research required. So the question is whether we invest tens to hundreds of billion dollars of human spaceflight, astronauts, NASA astronauts, do we invest in landings on the moon again? And what is derived out of that? I know some of my contemporaries, uh, the last man would not like to continue to be the last man forever. Or do we invest in a fundamental transition of human conditions in the solar system? We're at an inflection point, we can choose to do what's easy and safe. Or we can choose to do what's hard and make a difference. The choice to me is absolutely clear. There's no other choice than to commit to permanence at Mars. Humans need to explore, to push beyond current limits, just as we did 44 years ago. To make this vision a reality will require public support and cooperation. And we need to make sure that our young people all over the world are excited about studying STEAM, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. If you don't bring along the arts, it's... If you don't bring along the arts into our education system, it is only for geeks. <laughs> and we got to make sure it's a little broader than that. We can include the arts, and we call it steam power. What we need most is for the next generation to be motivated to push technological boundaries and seek new innovations. It's the only way we can move forward. And I know that I will continue to do my best to move our space program forward. As for my unified space vision, I will have updates from time to time on my website at buzzaldrin.com. As new technologies emerge, I'll try to keep our site up to date. She will. <laughs> so if you're interested in learning more, go to my website and click on space vision. Also, don't forget 
to follow me on Twitter at the real buzz. <laughs> Apollo. Apollo is the story of people at their best, working together for a common goal. We started with a dream, and we can do these kind of things again. With a united effort and a great team, we can again achieve great things. I know, because I'm living proof that we can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you we got guys. time for a... Thank you, guys. <laughs> On with the program. Thank you, Buzz. That's inspirational as always, and we appreciate hearing your words and a great opportunity to hear what you had to say. Now, you proved back in July of 1969 that you can operate when the systems don't always work the way they're supposed to. Right? But back then, you didn't go long. What? You didn't go long. That was what counted, right? What do you mean I didn't go long? In 69, you landed where you were supposed to land. Oh, we didn't go long. Long. <laughs> right. Yeah, we did land a little bit long. Okay. We, anyway, Mike could never find us down there. We have something for you, Buzz. <laughs> Dave. Buzz? Yeah. Thank you very much. We're, we're honored to present this award to Buzz. Stan? Come on. This. This is definitely not community property. <laughs> we're, we're very fortunate at the National Space Society to have Buzz come here to ISTC year after year. He's very steadfast in supporting our organization. And what an honor to have this gentleman. Let's give him a big hand. At this point, I'd like to have Dr. May Jemison come to the stage. Dr. Jemison started out her career working for the Peace Corps as a doctor, and then moved into the Center for Disease Control. At some point, she made it into NASA and became one of the first astronauts to fly after the Challenger incident. Hopefully, uh, probably the safest uh, shuttle mission ever. <laughs> but uh, she's now currently working with nonprofit organizations. She has her own nonprofit called the 100 Year Starship. And they have a conference in September that we should all go to. So buy your tickets now, get registered, right? I think there was about 400 people last year and we're gonna have, we're gonna double numbers this year. Thank you. May I say something? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, Actually, I just wanted to say a couple of words. Um, it is always really thrilling to be with uh, any place with Buzz. It was one of my uh, great pleasures, actually, to have been on the celebration of the 35th anniversary of Star Trek. And the two people that they had there as real people had gone into space was Buzz Aldrin. And then I had the opportunity to be there as well, sort of presenting, right? <laughs> presenting presenting plaques to the crew members of the various starships. But let me just tell you really quick, I'm gonna correct something a little bit on my resume. I was born in, Chicago, I was born in Alabama during the 19, in Alabama, in Decatur, Alabama, um, just as the Redstone Arsenal and everything was being built. And one of the things that I realized is I grew up during the Apollo era, and the reason I'm here is very much about being able to be part of and understand the vision of space exploration and all what it meant to be able to share uh, at some point in time to be able to meet people that you had such admiration for means a lot. But the thing that I want to add on to this is during the 60s was a time when everyone was not included in space exploration in a lot of people's minds and ideas. And in fact, there was now, no offense meant to anybody, but there were a group of women who were actually tested with the same kinds of um, experiments 
that they tested on the male astronauts, right? The people who became astronauts. And the women did as well as are better than men, right? And in fact, in the isolation studies, they blew them out of the water. Now, I bring this up only because there was a choice that was made at that point in time where Lyndon Johnson wrote, stop this now. Because the intent was not to have women involved in space exploration. It had nothing to do with capacity or responsibility. You could say the same thing in terms of people of color and other things. So when I was growing up as a little girl, I could see beyond that. But there were a lot of people who couldn't because they were not included. So I think our challenges today is to make sure that there is much better inclusion. My background is a chemical engineer. I also majored in African studies. I did dancing. And then I went to medical school, so I'm a physician. And yes, I worked as the area medical officer for Peace Corps um, in Sierra Leone and Liberia. But really, I did sustainability, technology design development. I'm bringing this up because when we talk about 100-year starship, which is to make sure that we have the capabilities of sending humans to another star system, not to mount a mission, to make sure that we garner that explosive creativity that's part of space exploration, of a great challenge. It's because of those different backgrounds. It's because I know that we have to include other people. We have to include the full range of our not only gender, ethnicity, and geography, but disciplines as well. So the STEAM and the culture and the governance and the economies. And so when I get this award, I wanted to spend this time with you, it's very important to me because it says that we're st we think and we know that these things are important. And as I work on 100 Year Starship, and yes, the conference is in Houston, um, it's a 100 Year Starship public symposium because we look at inclusion. We invite people to come uh, September 19th through the 22nd. The title of the symposium is Pathway to the Stars, Footprints on Earth, because that's what we have to do. We have to apply all those incredible technologies to be back here on Earth. Our theme is we believe that pursuing an extraordinary tomorrow will create a better world today. And Will and Ariel Durant said, the future never just happened. It was created. And what we're doing right now is creating that kind of future. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask if Buzz will take a picture with me. <laughs> Thank you. This is really a thrill, right? I'm going to, you guys have those guys behind. Come here, come here. Have you ever read Encounter with Tiber? <laughs> you know, you don't have to wait a hundred years if some other alien race is going to give you the technology <laughs> from Alpha Centauri, where the Earth-sized planet there should be called Tiber. Well, just in case, we're going to try it both ways. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't, don't expect more huh? speed. No, we'll do the best we can. Thank you. Come on down this way. All right. I have one more it's truly an honor to have. Oh, yes, I have a couple, too. Do you want to make yours now? I'll follow up. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, we have a couple activities this afternoon. We're having the kickoff of space up in the Aventine Ballroom at 2 o'clock, and I think it might be 2 o'clock already, so it might be in progress. Please go to that, learn what space up is about, and participate. It's very interesting. It's an opportunity for everyone here to speak. Also, we have uh, Art Dula after that, following in the same room at 2.30. He's showing a spacesuit that he has that Ed Liu used to wore when he, uh, he actually wore the suit when he descended in the Soyuz capsule, and he's going to talk to students about that. And we're going to have our distinguished Buzz Aldrin signing books in the exhibit hall. And whoever bought their books first, you're good to go. Get in line, and we're going to have a lot of books. Buzz, I hope you brought your bionic, bionic signing hand, because we got a lot of books. <laughs> and uh, with that, yeah, he's, he's good at it. Um, thank you very much. At this point, Stan has an announcement. I just wanted to remind you that we do have cameras here. These historic events and the presentations that you've been hearing have all been recorded. The DVDs are available in the, uh, in the uh, lobby where we're uh, registering, so you can find the DVDs there. We're going to adjourn the session now. Beat a hot trail to the 2 o'clock session. We'll see you there. Thanks for coming.